Welcome to the 2017 uh, Iowa City Book Festival presented by the Un Iowa City Uni UNESCO City of Literature. Uh, we would like to thank the sponsors who made this event possible, and the City of Iowa City, the University of Iowa, the Iowa Arts Council, the Iowa City Coralville Convention and Visitors Bureau, the Iowa Public Radio, and the Tuesday Agency. Between events, be sure to visit the book fair at Merge, that's at 136 South Dubuque Street, right next door to the public library on the Ped Mall. Uh, there you can shop with authors, artists, booksellers, and more, and enjoy complimentary coffee from the local roaster, Wake Up Iowa City. The vast majority of the book festival events are offered without charge, but they are not free. Uh, your tax deductible donation gives us the ability to offer programs like this very festival, Please consider supporting the City of Literature by texting the word book, that's all small, let, small letters, book, to 319-774-7669. I'll repeat that. That's 319-774-7669, and follow the link. So today, we will hear from author Inara Verzemniks. Inara Verzemniks teaches creative nonfiction at the University of Iowa. She has won a Pushcart Prize and a Rona Jaffe Writer's Award and has been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Feature Writing. Her new book is Among the Living and the Dead. She lives in Iowa City. Please help me welcome our author. Thank you all for coming out and braving the rain. Libraries actually are the perfect place to be on a rainy day, so I think it's fitting that we're all here. Uh, I am uh, very, very happy to be reading this book today. Um, this book started in Iowa City. I mean, it started much further back, um, obviously being um, something that is drawn from my family story. But I never imagined that I would write about my family story. I always saw that as something that was separate, that was personal, certainly that informed me and informed my way of looking at the world. But the stories that I assembled about my grandparents' lives never felt that they would be the subject of my writing. I had trained as a journalist and, and worked in newspapers for a number of years. I saw myself um, as committed to telling the stories of others. Um, and even if I brought sometimes what felt like a more personal lens to those stories, I really shied away from anything that required uh, an overt use of I. And when I first had come to Iowa as a graduate student, I imagined that I would be telling a very different story, one that was more journalistic and completely removed from my own life, and was lucky enough to have a professor who pushed me and um, really sort of made me realize that if one of my goals in coming to Iowa had been to figure out how I would push myself as a writer, how I would move beyond what I already knew how to do, then I should do something that scared me. I should do something that felt completely unfamiliar, that felt like um, I did not have mastery over it yet. And so through her um, not gentle prodding, uh, I began to attempt to figure out how I might tell uh, the story of my family. At first, I imagined um, I would write about my grandmother's sister. In between the time when I left the, my job at the newspaper and uh, came to Iowa, I traveled to Latvia, where my family is from, for the first time. And although I had been the collector of my family's stories, I had been um, sort of the designated keeper in my family. I never traveled to Latvia even after it regained its independence. Most of the time I came up with excuses that I was busy with work, um, that I couldn't take the time off. Um, I, I think um, in retrospect, I now see that I, I really didn't want to challenge those stories. I actually wanted to hang on to the stories I'd been given, and I suspected inevitably that to actually go there would mean having to, um, having to call into question some of the things that I had held as stable, as, um, un, as absolutely sort of unimpeachable. And I think I needed time. I needed time before I was actually really ready to be able to reconsider um, what I had always known. 
also ready to be able to ask a very different question than I think what had always motivated me in thinking about my family. And that was not so much what are the stories, but why are these the stories that I'm being told? And so that first trip to Latvia was extraordinary, but it was personal. It wasn't research. It wasn't um, something that I thought I was going to turn into any kind of piece. And I carried that visit with me, though, into, um, into my studies as a, as a graduate student here. And I realized I should try to record it somehow. So I began to think, if I wrote about my grandmother's sister, who was still alive, who I had met there, and her experiences as an exile in Siberia, that would, that would be the story I could tell. And I still could avoid putting myself in it too much. Um, but quickly, I realized the error of my ways. There was no way that I could tell her story without explaining her connection to my grandmother. And there was no way I could talk about my grandmother without explaining what she meant to me. Um, my um, parents had a pretty disastrous coming undone when I was two, and I went to live with my grandmother and grandfather, and um, she really saved me in many, many, many respects. And it was um, one of the most important relationships in my life. And so I, I would need um, to begin to figure out how not only to explore that territory, but to articulate it, to render it on the page. Um, so that's hopefully also a little bit of uh, context for you before I begin to read today. I thought a lot about where I would read from the book, and I decided that I would, um, I would read from the beginning, since Iowa was a beginning of sorts for me in coming to this project and writing it. Um, I would go ahead and start um, with the very beginning of the book. One of the, the um, things about the book that may be helpful to know is that what I've done is I have essentially uh, attempted to tell the story of two sisters, of my grandmother and her sister, and to explore what happened to each of them um, in the wake of World War II, to trace each of their individual trajectories. My grandmother fled Latvia um, and made her way uh, through the chaos of Europe um, into allied territory into a DP camp where she and the children uh, waited for almost eight years before getting sponsorship to the United States, and they eventually settled in the Tacoma area. Um, her sister remained behind in an attempt to hold on to the family land, and as a result of trying to remain behind and holding on to the family land in 1949, when the Soviets began um, mass collectivization of the countryside, she was exiled to Siberia. Um, it was just kind of the easiest way to deal with um, getting all of the property and not really having to deal with the farmers. And so she was placed on a train with her family and, um, and sent into the Far East. And um, I'm looking at those two particular stories, trying to resurrect, recreate them. At the same time, I'm also threading through my own present day visits to Latvia, what it was like to return to that place um, and to attempt to recover um, the spaces where there had been silence in my, inside my family's story. The road I must travel to reach my grandmother's lost village is like tracing the progression of an equation designed to restore lost time. Each kilometer that carries me from Riga seems to subtract five years. First, there are the gas stations and Swedish supermarket chains, signs ever burning. Next come the old Soviet era apartment buildings, stubborn blocks of concrete and pebble dash, their facades brittle and peeling like the skin of old wasps' nests. Down in the parking lots, old women pile bones for stray cats. From this point, the land begins its reclaiming, grass and Queen Anne's lace rooting through abandoned concrete slabs. Occasionally, a house will appear, canted and suffering, maybe with a slope-shouldered figure poking at a smoldering brush pile in the yard. But just as quickly, these glimpses are smothered by the trees. Sometimes, a house stands still long enough to admit that it is abandoned, portions of the roof skinned away to reveal blackberries growing on the inside, the surrounding fields neck high and riotous. Soon, the village center announces itself. First come the thumps of the railroad tracks, and then the houses, clad in wood worn as gray as lichen. Sheets snap on clotheslines, 
A van parked in a gravel turnout advertises smoked carp. A man teeters along the shoulder on a child's bicycle, a bottle wrapped in brown paper poking its neck from his jacket pocket. The center holds for a few more seconds, and then, abruptly, it gives up and lets the fields resume their patter. Rapeseed, rye, rapeseed, rye. Eventually, the fields stop, just long enough to take a breath, revealing a long, rutted driveway. At the end sits a home made from brick, modern by the standards of the countryside, clearly built within the last 60 years after the Second World War though the sun and the snow and the rain have worried it to the point of exhaustion. The yard is still, except for three chickens, muttering and picking their way across tindered grass. The house acts as if it is empty, though I know someone is inside waiting for me. I sit for a moment, listening to the car's cooling engine, the chickens clapping their beaks, skimming the air for insects I can't see. And just as, I am about, as just as I am trying to think of what I want to say, how to introduce myself to someone I have always and never known, the door to the little house opens, and I see my grandmother. Of course, by this time, my grandmother, the woman who raised me, has been dead for more than five years. This is why I had journeyed to my grandmother's lost village, nestled at the edge of Latvia, which is itself nestled at the edge of Europe's psychic north, south, east, and west, or as Pope Innocent III describes it in a papal bull written in the 13th century, the edge of the known world. Because I imagined maybe I might find her again in the old stories that still existed there. Maybe what I mean to say is that I hope to see, as the writer Rebecca West has put it, what history meant in flesh and blood, and I suppose you could say the same recycled hope is what then moved me to return year after year for what would ultimately become five consecutive years until I could almost convince myself that I knew what it was like to live there at the edge of the known world, as if I were an old story too, at least for as long as the handful of weeks or months I managed to string together with each trip. People say, if the old stories are to be trusted, when in fact the old stories never stopped being trusted, because trust is different than belief. Belief is to faith, to truth, as trust is to comfort, to consolation. Whether a matter of comfort or of consolation, it's long been assumed of this region where my grandmother was born and where she made her life until the outbreak of the Second World War, that at some point each year the dead will come home. And while general consensus holds that the dead's arrival can be read in the last stalks of grain as they lengthen with the shadows, a signal that the fields are ready for the final pass of the scythe, no one can say which route the dead take on their annual pilgrimage, whether they walk alone or in procession. Now that I know my grandmother's lost village as well as I do, I like to imagine them cutting through its streets, lingering at the windows of the beauty salon where the last of the summer brides are having their hair set, slipping just past the reach of the angry goat tethered in the field adjacent to the crumbling apartment blocks. It's possible, of course, that the dead prefer to make their way through the forests where they can wander the nettle hen paths, looking for the last of the mushrooms, blackening now, the soft, gilled undersides thick with worms. Perhaps some of them recall where the old woods hide, the Soviet missile base, birch trees growing from the roofs of the abandoned living quarters, piles of sodden clothing strewn at the entrances to the former command center, the deep furrows in the earth that mark the old beds of the nuclear warheads. Should the dead choose to go through the fields and its evening, they can always fall in line behind the heavily uttered cows, nipples shuddering and arcing milk with each thudden step. Maya, 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 the herders sing and clap the air at their backs. Home, home, home. Whether it's their childhood home or the last home that the dead inhabited that they choose to visit during this time, no one really knows. But it's long been understood that once a year, it's possible for the dead to suspend their exile from our world and cross back over to see how life has continued in their absence. At one time, this idea would have been a source of great consolation to both the living and the dead. The possibility of return, however brief, 
to shoulder open the front door and find the row of boots, mud and manure crusted, still next to the far wall, one of the barn cats, broken whiskered and notch eared, secret sprayers at the flocks and hosta beds trying to slink in behind them. And everyone around the table, stabbing cabbage, slathering black bread with butter. With each visit, the dead would watch the lives of the not dead progress. The new fumbling couples, whispering and biting at down pillows. The blinking infants, swaddled and mewling. The graying heads, rasping and hacking into the closing dark. And while the living wouldn't have seen the dead during this time, they understood that the dead were close, watching. They might have called out their names, talked to them, told them what they had missed over the past year, even set them a regular place at the table to encourage their company. But eventually, the living would decide that the visit had gone on long enough. Maybe they worried the dead were getting too comfortable and might never want to leave. So they would politely inform the dead that it was time for them to go back to their world and wait for the next turn of autumn. They fell into an easy rhythm, the living and the dead, anticipating this annual reunion. And that was the first mistake, assuming that this was how things would be for eternity. Because let's say suddenly one year, the dead pushed open the door to their old home and found everyone gone. Only empty rooms and overturned chairs and scattered papers and a pile of white fur and bones in the old root cellar. It's hard to imagine that the dead who found this would have wanted to linger for long because it was so new to them, but because it was so new to them, this emptiness, maybe the dead liked having their old home to themselves at first, liked the way it allowed them to remember, unchallenged, the way things were in their time. But how many times can you unhasp all the safety pins in the sewing basket or place your palms on the surface of every mirror before you long for the presence of someone else to remind you that you were there? even in death. So when the dead returned again the next year and suddenly saw smoke clawing its way from the chimney, it's possible they felt something rising in them too, something like hope. But once they crossed the threshold, they would see how everything was wrong, hay on the floors, ankle deep, the air thick with the smell of ammonia and dung, lowing from every room, scraping hooves, dozens of wet eyes meeting theirs in the dark, tails thumping against the walls of rooms turned stalls. Even if it so happened that people eventually reclaimed the home of the dead from the cows, these newcomers would be no one the dead knew or anyone who knew the dead, strangers speaking a strange language, living behind worn blankets that had been hung from the ceiling, crude dividers simulating some semblance of personal space. But that could not block out the sounds of the night, the groaning, the stiff shuffling to the back of the house, once a bedroom, now a makeshift privy, a hole hacked in the floor over which everyone squatted. This is where, according to the logic of the living, it would have made sense to turn away, to retreat, maybe to the barn, empty except for the tractor that identified this as a collective farm, Russian-made, narrow-snouted, like the dogs that once slunk through here long ago, secretly rooting through the stalls. But what do we, the living, know of how the dead define their losses? What we can say is that a ritual the living had once imagined as a way for the dead to visit the homes of their memories had in fact become a search for a sign that those homes ever existed. Because after the blankets came down and the tractor disappeared from the barn, when trash and broken glass became the only records of habitation, then it was just fleas and mice and the occasional drunk curled up on the floor with a bottle, hiding from his wife in a place she would never think to look. And then after that, nothing. Only silence and decay until all that remained was a jumble of broken boards in an overgrown field. It was not just the physical home that had been lost to the dead. Now, no one sets a place for them anymore or anticipates their coming. In recent years, Anyone who could be a descendant of the dead has left this countryside for more prosperous regions of Europe, places where it's possible to find not only work, but something that is certain to put more than a few hundred dollars in their pocket each month and does not require one to muck stalls or buck hay or handle cow's teats. The living might come back briefly for a wedding or a christening or a funeral, bottles clinking in plastic bags from the airport duty-free, 
But the truth is that the dead now come more frequently than the not dead, each year after the harvest, if the stories can be trusted, stumbling through the fields, down the two-lane roads, across the shorn fields, searching for reassurance in a landscape that offers its reply in the form of empty clotheslines, untended graves, winter snows, unbroken now by a single step. There was a time when migrant flocks of Buick swans and whooper swans stopped here each year to winter in the bogs and fens. And so the region was named for these birds, gulbene, from the Latvian word gulbis, or swan. Located on the country's eastern edge, two hours from the Russian border, this place has witnessed centuries of migration and flight. Some years it was members of the order of the brothers of the sword who invaded, emissaries of the pope, their shields decorated with images of crucifixes and sharpened blades, their armor decorated with the spray of pagan blood. Other years, it was Ivan the Terrible's men galloping through on horseback, rapiers drawn and torches in hand. Occasionally, there were Vikings shaking snarled beards and shields, as well as soldiers who answered to a Swedish king who preferred to keep his facial hair in a trim Van Dyke. Mostly, though, it was armies dispatched by Tsars and Tsarinas or those sent by Kaisers. And after that, men who demanded that they be addressed as general secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, or Führer. Once, the people who lived here didn't even bother distinguishing between the different routes that cut through their land. They simply called the paths in and out of the region by one name, war roads. The roads to the region are mostly empty now. Sometimes you can go hours without seeing another passing car. But there are days when it feels like the travelers of the war roads are out there still, all those ghost armies advancing, retreating through the landscape, their presence suggested in the graffitied bunkers left to decay in the fields, and in the sudden disappearance of roadside trees felled to block an incoming, incoming army's advance and never replanted. There are always in the background the sound of their phantom boots on the landscape, as steady as a heartbeat. All these troops from all these eras, a formation of tattered uniforms and missing limbs, marching through the collective memory, silently, endlessly, the harbingers of flight. And everyone in their path runs, is still running through the years and generations. This is where I come from, from this place of flight daughter, granddaughter, and great-granddaughter to those who once lived at the edge of the war roads and who came to feel the ter their terrible pull. What happened to my family here happened long before I was born, but I know now that my life started the instant the road claimed them, that when it led them away from the land all those years ago and scattered them, some to the west, to be dropped at the edge of the ocean they call silent in their old language, and others to the east, to disappear into the territories of the banished, it made their exile mine, as much a part of me as any characteristic governed by heredity, like the nearsightedness that by the time I was seven would reduce my view of the world to what fell within an arm's length in front of me. Whatever lay in the distance, no matter how hard I tried to make out its contours, was always lost to me. It helped that I was raised to believe in the existence of what I could not see. The language and stories of my childhood were always referencing hidden places, and one of those places waited on the other side of, the, of death. That's what the old homesick Latvians would say, that when we die, we go to live in a land that's found beyond the sun. They said this not as superstition or myth, but as habit, the reflexive tick of centuries of belief, now preserved in figures of speech that tended to emerge late at night after the drinks had left everyone tremulous and heavy-lidded, such as, one day we'll meet in the place that exists beyond the sun. Beyond the sun, life is said to not be too dissimilar from this one. In fact, it's said that there we do the same things we've always done, except we're no longer alive. Dead farmers look after dead cows that are herded by dead dogs. Dead children presumably go to schools where they are taught by dead teachers who take their grading home at night to apartment buildings full of dead neighbors. Dead cats leave dead moles on the doorsteps of the dead. There are moments when this strikes me as one of the most strange and beautiful ideas I've ever heard. And then there are moments when it makes me terribly sad, imagining a world unfolding parallel to this one, where everyone is going through the motions of home, trying to hold on to its shape and memories, but it isn't home. And now, from within this sadness, a realization 
I'm not describing the dead anymore. I'm describing us and our life in the little bowed house that we shared, my grandmother Livia, my grandfather Amos, and me. I can still recall the way the house slunk low, like a person trying to hide, the plum tree that dropped its watery fruit on the front lawn in drifts like snow, how the floor and the walls of the cellar beneath the house were only earth. And yet I hesitate to say that this is the place where I grew up. Maybe it is more accurate to say that this is the place where I learned of the existence of our true home, the one we could no longer see, but that called to us nonetheless from somewhere out there, far beyond the buzz of the paper mills, the single ever spewing spire of the copper smelter that turned the grass of the yards bordering it, a mesmerizing yet unsettling chartreuse, and the stacks of shipping containers, corrugated blues and yellows and reds that formed the edges of our accepted horizon. Our true home, so the stories went, were the ones that my grandmother, like the ones my grandmother read to me at night from a battered edition of Grimm's fairy tales, the spine broken and held in place by tape, was far, far away in the province of the swans, but we could never go back there again. Nor could anyone from that world visit, world visit us to remind us of who we were and where we came from. Though once, my grandmother's mother had apparently shown up at our home moments after her death, more than 5,000 miles away, but only my grandmother saw her. She emerged from the seam that runs between darkness and daylight to stand at the edge of my grandmother's bed as my grandfather snored and twitched beside her. It was the first time my grandmother had seen her mother in more than 20 years, and her face looked withered like flowers left in a vase without water. My grandmother opened her mouth to say something, but before she could speak, before she could form the words, forgive me, her mother leaned over and placed a calloused palm on my grandmother's curled head. She let it rest there a moment, then she disappeared. My grandmother seemed to accept the brief terms of this visitation. She too, as I understood it, had disappeared just as quickly from her family's life, though her vanishing had been the living kind, born of war and panic, the heavy trundle of red-starred tanks over cobblestone, airships swimming overhead, flames where roofs should have been, and from somewhere nearby, the sound a building makes just before it crumbles, a whoosh of air, like a breath released from a cracked sternum. Alone with two small children, her husband away at the Russian front, my grandmother had monitored the climax of the Second World War from a rented apartment in the Latvian capital with an address of 71 Peace Street. Between the choiring of the bombs, she breastfed her newborn son and hoped she could remain in one place long enough for her body to heal, for the bleeding to finish. But as the glass in the windows rippled, and it became clear she couldn't wait where she was any longer. She dropped diapers into a sack and tied a scarf around her shoulders. She picked up her three-week-old son, made her two-year-old daughter clasp her hand, and ran. As she had explained it to me growing up, there was no time to write a letter, to address it to the family who waited three hours to the east in Golbena in a brown shingled farmhouse where my grandmother had been born and which she had left only a few years before the first in her family to venture beyond its boundaries for a new life in the city. The day she left the farm, her whole family had accompanied her to the train station, still in their milking boots, and they had cried and waved at my grandmother until the train finally pulled beyond view. Now there was no time for my grandmother to say goodbye to her mother and her father and her brother and her sister, no way to tell them where she was heading, because even she had no idea. It was too late for her to do anything, except try to stay on her feet and ahead of the troops, thousands of them, marching behind the battle standard of the USSR, red silk screened with hammer and sickle, Latvia's new flag. I now know that my grandmother left Latvia at the beginning of October 1944. It was late June 1945 before she finally crossed into British occupied territory in, in the north of Germany. There, she and her children were officially registered as displaced persons, ultimately assigned to a refugee camp on the outskirts of the port city of Hamburg, where she and the children sometimes went on day passes to pick through the firebombing's char, burned brick and pooled metals, searching for things to trade or that might fuel their cook fires. But when she was alive, my grandmother never emphasized the length or difficulty of her journey across Europe, 
what she might have seen in her months that she wished she could forget, in her memories that she wished she could forget. And while the stories she told implied great difficulty and sorrow, she erased them of the grim particulars, made them archetypal enough to feel memorable, recognizably powerful, without exposing me to the specificity of her own traumas. A friend from Riga joined me to help with the children. We slept in the woods at night and dried diapers on branches. We looked for farmhouses and offered help with the cows in exchange for milk, a place to sleep. Her story existed for me only in simple outline, like the life-size self-portraits we made in elementary school art class by lying on our backs on the blank expanse of butcher paper while the teacher traced our jittering bodies, our physical presence in the world suggested through negative space, the hollows held inside the lines. In much the same way, I accepted the presence of what went unspoken in my grandmother's war stories as evidence of something that did not have to be made explicit in order to be registered, understood. She did not have to say terror or shame or anguish for me to feel these things held inside her as clearly as if I had held them inside me too. My grandmother Livia chose instead to speak about the place she had left as if she had never left. Over the years, as she lay on her pallet in the refugee camp, where she would live so long after the war that she and my grandfather would trace the years by the addition to their family, two children becoming four, two boys and two girls. As she clutched the family's passports and entrance papers to the United States and felt the transport planes rising, its wings tipped to the sea, my grandmother never stopped saying the name of the home she had lost. Tacoma she practiced, as the smell of the mills punched through the cracks in the window of her new home, an apartment in a downtown tenement where the volunteers from Tacoma Lutheran Family Services had indicated through gentle pantomime that the family of six now lived. But that word always remained unsure on her tongue. It would never sound as natural as the way she said Lemby, which she had first learned from her grandfather, a shoemaker from Golbene who eschewed whiskers but let his eyebrows grow like cumulus clouds. The name he had bestowed on the two-bedroom farmhouse he built under the shelter of two maple trees. There he raised his only child, a boy, who would grow up to become my grandmother's father, a man of waxed mustaches and a fine way with hops, known for the batches of ale he kept in the granary, always enough to lend to a wedding or a wake. My grandmother's mother was 10 years younger than her husband, and everyone agreed that she possessed the patience required to ret the farm's flax and spin its fibers into linen so fine and soft that it felt weightless. Yet she was also quick to snap a switch from the nearest tree if she sensed the slightest misbehavior. This was the world my grandmother Livia was born into, where landscape was lineage and the span of a life could be measured by all that was held within the farm's boundaries. There, she knew it was summer, by the smell of fresh mown hay, fall when the saffron milk caps rose from the decay of the forest floor, spring by the storks winging overhead. Each day was organized around the rhythm and habits of the cows, and almost as soon as my grandmother and her siblings could walk, they were toddling barefoot behind the slow-hoofed cortege as it mouthed its way across the pastures, and they remained with the herd until evening, when it was time to drive them back to their places in the barn. The children did this for years, back and forth, stall to pasture, until they spent more time in the company of cows than any other living being. Long after my grandmother had settled in America, she would visit the dairy barn at the state fair, wandering the labyrinth complex and appraising each cow with tender eyes. Always, there would be a cow or two that stirred something close to rapture in her. Oh, how beautiful, she would say, standing unselfconsciously in her heels among the splatters, taking care to address the animal directly. What a fine cow you will be. My grandmother spent more than a decade not knowing what had happened to her family and to the farm after she fled Latvia. And when she was finally able to reestablish contact with her relatives in Gulbina, communication was sporadic, halting, the letters subject to censors' eyes. How far away she felt from the days when she could sit with her family in the kitchen of the farmhouse, everyone nursing cups of hot tea, replaying the events of the day. Often, it was a catalog of nothing. Maybe a heifer had been born with a broken mouth. A cloud had passed overhead in the shape of a girl. The bees seemed agitated. 
Now, as she sat alone at her kitchen table in Tacoma, crying over the pages of the latest stilted letter, we went far away to work for a time. There was a part of my grandmother that understood she could never return to that place again. But there was also a part of my grandmother that refused to accept the idea she could never return to that place again. In the end, my grandmother decided to try to find a way to occupy the space that bordered both realities. Until the day she could return to the farm, she would rebuild it here in America, board by board, through memory. At first, she did it by herself, silently setting the survey lines. She raised the sky just far enough overhead so that it felt as if you could reach up and brush your fingers against it when you lay on your back in the grass. She smoothed the fields out to the edges of the horizon and then summoned the forest, dense and dark. Behind the screening branches, she placed the ant hills and the badger burrows. Orchard sown, she replanted the gooseberries and currants and let their rows grow unruly, vines curling back on themselves like the ends of her father's mustache. She staked the stems of the lolling dahlias and drove posts for the picket fence deep into the soil, but still it would list. She bucked hay into the loft and stacked logs for winter's approach. But since this was a world summoned entirely from memory, there were places where the landscape dropped away without any explanation, sudden chasms of white space, unresolved constructions. The milking barn contained stools, but not a single churn. The horse grazed endlessly, reins dragging through clover. Inside the house, some of the rooms appeared never to have been framed or plastered. The same hallway led to different bedrooms, each time it was accessed. Outside the kitchen window, lilacs bloomed, regardless of the season. Thank you very much. And now we have some time for me to take some questions. And I believe we have a microphone here because this is being recorded. A slight warning to you in case you don't want your question to be recorded forever. So I biked through Lafayette about 15 years ago. Yeah. And there's many things that you said were brought to mind again. But the most interesting thing was to go by one of the Russian bases and see all the broken windows and all the uh, bricks stolen away for usage elsewhere. And to know that they were there once a huge base. And then after passing through the base, uh, hearing an Orthodox church ring its lonely bell. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, those bases were entire cities and it's sort of incredible. The one in particular that I referenced in the opening got a chance to kind of wander around while mushrooming one day. And you could, t I mean, it was, it was, li it was literally, into there was a school building, there were tons of barracks, and there was everything that you needed to be sort of self-sufficient and contained in those woods. And to see that emptiness, that silence is just absolutely overpowering. Um, thank you, Nara. Um, you know, in nonfiction, we often talk about memoir or autobiography as opposed to or standing aside or being in opposition to journalism and research. And one of the things that I think makes the book very interesting is precisely that it, you do both, right? Um, you interviewed family members, you conducted what you know, can be called ethnographic research in some, in some ways. You, know, you, you research myths, history. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like to apply journalistic techniques to your own family and conduct interviews in that way? Yeah, um, and I'm glad you asked that question, Nico, because I had a, an epiphany the other day where I was realizing that um, it's so funny because people do tend to sort of, and even I, in my own conception of memoir, saw that as, as almost like you know completely opposite what I would have been doing in journalism. And my epiphany recently was that um, I am anyway, in particular, I'm drawn to memoir that seems very much driven by a desire uh, to understand the world outside the self. And in that process, perhaps, then we gain more understanding of the self. And I was like, well, that's the journalistic impulse. You know, I mean, the journalistic impulse is to investigate and explore the external world uh, and through that to find a, a sense of kind of deeper meaning or understanding. So I was like, yeah, wait, they're, they're the same, they're cousins. Um, 
And in terms of with my own family, though, that was actually where I, in some cases, experienced the most difficulty. Um, I, I had gained somewhat of a reputation in the newsroom where I worked that I was someone who could handle sensitive stories. So I would often be the person um, dispatched, you know, to give one example, when there was um, two young men who um, attempted uh, to commit suicide together. Um, one died, the other did not. When they wanted someone to interview the families and try to interview the survivor, the, like I'm the person who had the editor at my desk asking me to go do that. Um, and I felt that I developed over the years um, real strategies to, at least in my mind, as I saw it at the time, not do more harm um, and to navigate situations with um, everyday folks, so to speak, not so much sort of politicians or people who would normally be in the public eye, but just regular people who, for whatever reason, had sort of been thrust into the news. And then going to Latvia and attempting formally to begin interviewing my grandmother's sister, who at that point was in her mid-80s, um, I, I, I realized how much I did not know. Um, what I thought I had figured out um, sort of was broken back open. Um, she very, very specifically, very deliberately, like many people do in order to be able to survive their traumas, had constructed a life where she lived in the present tense. Um, very specifically. That was how she had been able to move on from the things that she had survived. And of course, she wanted to find out what had happened to my grandmother. She also wanted us to, to know what had happened. She certainly wanted to let us into that history. But, you know, that's the sort of, in some ways, that's the first conversation you have on the first tearful night that you're all together. Um, and you get the broad outlines again, but not the specifics. And here I am literally moving into her home and the expectation is that, you know, sort of every day we'll kind of try to dive back into this and summon specific details. And um, I went as gently as I could and really tried to follow her lead. So, for example, what became our rhythm was we would wake up in the morning, do the morning chores, have breakfast together. And then usually as she was clearing, like we would clear away the table and she would start to do dishes, she'd just start to talk. I wouldn't even need to ask a question. She would just begin to kind of enter that, um, that past tense historical space. And then um, I might ask a few questions, but mostly I would just try to listen. And then there would be a point where she would sort of push away and say, OK, outside, we got to go to work. And then I would spend the next several hours of the day just working beside her. Uh, we would not be talking um, or you know, not talking about anything more than shall we feed the cows now or shall we pick the peas. Um, and that's, that's how it went. And then occasionally I would start to be, I would get selfish and I would get fearful about um, you know, the, the story itself and where there were gaps and where there were elisions. And so I might gently push her. And, I could see the pain that that would cause. Um, and I try to reckon with that a little bit in the book, that I, I feel like one of the things that was always difficult for me in daily journalism was that the stories really never did include, they did not include the moments where, despite my best efforts, for example, not to cause more harm, I did cause more harm. Um, they do not include the moment when, for example, I was sent to go talk to the family of a young man who working hard college student fell asleep um, driving home and ran off the road and ran into two uh, state troopers and killed them. Um, it does not include the moment when I went to knock on the door and I could hear the keening inside and the pastor opens the door and um, he himself, I can see the devastation and tears as I am uh, asking him if I can find out more about this young man so he's not just a name. Um, I, that doesn't go in the story. Um, and what doesn't also go in the story is that then I get back in my car and there's new breaking information and so the city editor needs me to go back and knock on the door again to ask this next question. Um, and, and I was always uncomfortable with that, um, that those parts were left out. So I, I tried to find a way in the book to kind of reckon with, um, here I am, I am asking someone to return to a very pa painful place, why? Why would someone do that? And then also the effect of that. Um, in, there, there came a point, uh, slight humor here now to, to kind of break the moment. Uh, there's a dog. In Latvia, when you have a dog out in the countryside, that dog's job is to bite. I mean, that's job, that dog's job is like to protect the property. Uh, it would never, it seems like it never fly here. I find out later this dog had like bitten like about 12 people. Um, 
All I knew was that the dog always needed to be chained up when I was around, and usually they were pretty good about it. Anyway, uh, we had had a conversation the night before that had turned slightly heavy, but I thought all was good. And the, the long story made short is that the next day, there was a point when I left to go up the hill to see another family member and the dog was tied up. By the time I came back, the dog was loose. Uh, the dog bit me. Um, and when I asked Ausma about it, she said, yeah, it, you know, I feel bad for him tied up all the time. I, I thought I'd let him loose for a while. He knows you, he's okay. And, and I, at first I was so upset about the incident. I was actually like really, um, really devastated. And I had to kind of sort through like, why am I reacting so strongly? Especially because I think it was to a certain degree her moment of trying to just like draw a line and make herself feel safe for a minute. I mean, literally she sick the dog on me. Um, so those are some things that I try to find a way to deal with that my journalism career did not prepare me for what that's like when that's someone that's a family member. Did you have to change your style of writing at all, writing the memoir when, from when you were a journalist? Um, I was, and I will say that even though um, I, I was um, a newspaper journalist for a very long time, I was a bit of a square peg in a round hole. Um, I did the, the cops beat for a while, but I ended up being um, sort of turned, um, turned out into the features beat. So I was able to have a slightly different style than one might have if you were you know, kind of having to cover the, the city council meetings. Um, but yes, it, my style did have to change largely to include the presence of the eye. Um, that was something very different for me. It did not come instinctively. It did not come naturally. And there was something about needing to account for my presence in the frame that then also kind of affected the prose, so to speak. Um, one of the things that people often um, don't realize that I, I have a lot of fun kind of thinking about having come up through a newsroom is that um, there's a particular style of uh, literary journalism, creative nonfiction um, that is written by people who have been newspaper reporters that remains omniscient. It takes an omniscient point of view. I think of like Catherine Boo, for example, as um, one um, really um, good thing to point, good author to point to in this particular case. And she herself is never ever in the frame of these particular books, and yet. Her prose, her syntax is extremely distinct um, and very interesting. David Finkel is another writer um, also that I look to. And in both cases, even though the eye is never present, they, they, because of their newspaper training, which never allowed them to use the eye, they ended up developing a really fascinating style that allows them to get that sort of perspective, singular consciousness to come through. Um, so I, I kind of had felt like I had learned some tricks that had allowed me to figure out how to do that in my own prose. But then suddenly when I'm writing a, a memoir and it's demanded of me that, that I am in there, where are you? Where are you in this? Um, I had to kind of rethink a little bit some of maybe what had started to feel a little bit more habitual in terms of my word choice, in terms of my sentences, in terms of my voice. Uh, a little bit, a little bit of follow up to that, uh, and I don't know if it's a craft question or mm -hmm. a reporting question, but you're in there. You're, the level of uh, sensory detail that, that you uh, turn up is really beautiful and and i wonder if that comes from you know taking notes on the spot as you're moving through the country or are you dredging that up as you're writing or some combination of both um of it's a combination of both but primarily it is the research mm -hmm. and um I, I think one of the best i i'm constantly trotting out to my students they must be so sick of it but like great pieces of advice that came from crusty old editors in newsrooms. Um, but, but they remain some of the, the most helpful, sort of profound, most profound pieces of information um, that I ever received as a writer. And, and one in particular remains with me, and that is if you're having a problem with your writing, if you're having writer's block, then you have a problem with your reporting. Um, and and that's, that remains the case, I believe. I believe if you're sort of the writing is stodgy and it's just kind of pushed um, along simply by um, your strained attempts to, to substitute what you don't have in terms of substance with language, like, yeah, it, it shows. Um, I am pretty obsessive in the field um, in terms of 
like both note taking, um, I take video, I take photographs, um, I even draw things out sometimes simply because that kind of gets my brain thinking a different way about particularly like landscape and space. Um, yeah, so I'm really trying my best to have as much as possible to work from so that even when I am sitting down and writing and I can't just hop on a plane and go, that I have things that I feel like I can be confident then in particular like responses or memories that come up as a result of that. I'm doing my best to, to front load on the end of the material. As you were interviewing members of your family, did you use a tape recorder or did you just take notes? Yeah, at first I used a tape recorder. Um, and what's funny is, is that I actually, I don't use a tape recorder typically and didn't even as a reporter, only because oftentimes even if I had the luxury of a feature story, I was having to turn around fairly quickly. And I didn't have a transcriptionist. I didn't have someone who could do that for me. So I got actually really pretty good at taking notes um, in my own brand of shorthand, but like pretty, pretty stenographic. Um, but at first with the language, this kind of gets a little bit at the language, even though I speak Latvian, it was, it was a different experience in those initial interviews, kind of trying to, uh, trying, oh, I'm supposed to stand in front of the mic, sorry for the recording. Um, it was difficult um, trying to do something that had always been instinctive to me in one language, right? Like even right now, someone could stand up and say, you gotta go on assignment and go do this, and I would immediately be able to kind of get, in my, um, get my game face on and go do it. But I always had done that in English, so suddenly I'm trying to do this in a different language, and it, it felt different. It did not feel as familiar, which is just a kind of interesting lesson in how language moving between languages can work. So initially, yes, I was recording um, the interviews. And then as time went on, as the years returned, I was taking notes in those situations. But what's nice about the recordings is that um, I always think if you are working on a memoir yourselves about your family, one of the things that happens is that you, you become the archivist for your family because you're the person that is trying to pull all of these things together, all the documents, all the photographs that have always been scattered between everyone. And so that's a role that then transcends the project itself. You now are the person that has centralized all that information. And so you really kind of have a gift to be able to offer the rest of the family. So in terms of recording the interviews, you know, that is something that can last for someone else. When some other keeper of the stories comes along and maybe wants to continue with it, they will have it. So you mentioned the years that you did research on this. From the time that you started, actually, I, obviously this brewed in your head for a long time yeah. to do, but when you actually started the research to the ending of the book, how long did that take and what did your family think? Those are, yeah, very good questions. So, um, and in some ways kind of actually bleed together a little bit. So I, I will kind of say, I am, in my mind, I imagine that I formally started the project when I came here for graduate school and in that first semester when that professor pushed me and pushed me into the place that most frightened me. So that would be 2010. So um, immediately that first summer, I um, went back to Latvia and that began um, five consecutive summers of, of sort of living there in the countryside during that period in time. Um, and the book was published in July 2017. So now in terms of like, so research was happening almost up until the book <laughs> had to leave my hands. My editor is like pulling it out of my hands. Um, the writing, so it was interesting because one of the things that happens um, in an MFA program is that you know you're essentially being sort of forced to write, right? You're writing on um, on, a, on a schedule, on a deadline, and my my tendency in my past life would have been to report, 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 have everything, all the research, and then write. But I was having, because I was needing to like generate material and turn it in for workshop, I was often writing before all the research had been finished. Um, and that was a very strange sort of mind space to occupy. But what was good about it was that I was writing very steadily for a very long period in time. And so I think that really helped me in the revision process. Um, 
one interesting fact for those of you who love books and think about writing books, um, essentially from the moment you turn in a manuscript um, to an editor, you, you tag on like another year. There's a whole entire year that's devoted to the sort of um, the nuts and bolts of the publishing process. So it becomes something that you live with for a very, very long time. My family, um, I think that was very helpful for me in a way too, that I ended up, as I lived with it for a very long time, they lived with it for a very long time. So it became something that, that they really understood because they were, they were watching me live it. And I say this because I think sometimes in doing kind of quicker turnaround, it can be really difficult to fully convey to someone else what it is you're hoping to do as a writer, what, what this will become. And because they were able to be um, witness to the process with me, I think that they were able to understand maybe more solidly where I was heading with this and what I was doing. Um, in, uh, so I'll, I'll take two parts. In the Latvia part, I mean, I have you know, talked about the book, brought copies of the book, but for the most part, they don't speak English um, in that particular branch of the family. And so that's tough, and it's still not translated in Latvian. And I'm sort of desperate. This is my desperate plea. If any of you are publishers in Latvia, please take on the book. Um, and it's difficult. Like, like um, I joke with friends, um, but like if I had written the equivalent of Fifty Shades of Grey, someone would do a literary translation like almost immediately because it wouldn't be that taxing to do. Um, in the case of literary translation, it can it can you have to like a lot of things have to line up because it's a lot of work to find the right translator to do that particular work. So that I've, I still feel a little funny about in that I don't they haven't actually read it cover to cover, you know, in the same way that my family here has read it and. Um, so I made a choice. People often ask and say, like, so what did you do? Did you share the book? Like, what did you do? Um, I made a choice. If you read the book, you'll kind of understand maybe a little bit better um, some of the reasoning why. But I spent a lot of my life, to put it succinctly, I spent a lot of my life being very, very sensitive, very sensitive to other people's stories, sometimes to a certain degree that was was painful to me, I now see, um, harmful to me, I now see. And it was so difficult for me in many cases to find the words for some particular parts of this, uh, this book that I kind of made the decision to focus on myself and, and, and how important it was for me to say this in just the right way, put the words in just the right order, to express um, what, I, what I perceived, what I had discovered, and that if I were to share that too early and then begin to try to accommodate other people's stories, it might be at the expense of my own, and that I, I actually, and through a lot of grueling thought, I could see the ways in which that would result in something that could be more harmful than I think um, what I achieved and accomplished. And so um, all that's a long way to say, my, my dad, for example, did not read the manuscript before it was published, but he also didn't want to. Like I had given him a copy of my thesis and he made it to the dedication page and couldn't go any, could not go any further. Um, and so I also knew that it was kind of white hot for him to re-enter and revisit, but um, he, he read the book. I, I didn't hear from him for about a week, but I figured knowing what happened with the thesis, like I could kind of understand that he needed to ease his way into it. And then uh, I got a phone call. I happened to miss it because I was in class. And uh, he had gotten about 50 pages in. And um, it, was, it was the best reaction one could have hoped for. I mean, he was barely able to speak um, because he was so moved. But for him, it was he, all what had been so hard for him to touch was the fact that all of that, that difficulty, all of that trauma had never been sort of arranged in any kind of order. It was just too much. It was just too much. He couldn't even get his hands around it. And suddenly to have that arranged on a page for him, um, he could enter it, right? He couldn't enter into the chaos, but he could enter into something that was ordered. And he now has come to, he's not, he was sad. He could not even come to this one. Um, he's been to every one of the readings that I've had so far. Um, and he keeps saying like he's seeing his life in a new way. So that's the best possible answer. That doesn't happen for everyone all the time, but it makes me feel somewhat, um, it makes me feel good about my choice not to share it, and that was a choice made out of, truly out of love and not out of selfishness, and I, I feel like that allowed me then 
to not withhold, to not hold back. I realize now that sometimes we think holding back is a form of love, but I'm not so sure about that. I think sometimes telling is also a kind of love. So on that note, I think we need to wrap up because we have more readings to go to, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today.